It's only been in 1992 that executives were strongly coupled to life. And this really opened uh, a, a new field and kicked the, um, kicked the field into a new direction. Oh, I think now it's now. It's Sam, sorry, sorry. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so um, and so here, like then, then when you couple excitons strongly to life, you get these polaritons, mixed particles between an exciton and a photon. Uh, and what we see here is uh, a non-equilibrium condensate. These polaritons uh, go as as you increase uh, the um, the density. Uh, and so my personal favorite uh, of these experiments is this one, where you see like a stream of polaritons coming down here in the plane and hitting the defect. And, and when when the polaritons hit the defect, they kind of produce ripples uh, like water would in a stream. But then as you increase the density of these polaritons, the the, they become superfluid, and so you see that these ripples disappear. Um, and, and so, while we've seen like a lot of very interesting physics there, and basically everything is on the is uh, like falls into this regime of very weak interactions. So it's like everything can basically just be described on a on a mean field level. Uh, and so, like we've already seen this picture, uh, copperous oxide came along a couple of years ago, and. I think I have the nicer picture uh, of uh, of the crystal uh, of the internet here. Uh, it, it can look like like this uh, super nice uh, ruby uh, colored crystal. Uh, and then, uh, as Matt just showed you, uh, the group in Dortmund discovered that there can be an entire ripper series, like ranging from n equals two to incredible almost thirty uh, lines of the ripper spectrum. And so. Uh, what I want to discuss now, uh, similar to what Matt showed, uh, is like uh, is to discuss with you whether these states can now be brought towards uh, strong interactions. Uh, and if we want to understand interactions, of course, the first thing to do is to kind of analyze how the Rydberg excitons, how, how we expect that these Rydberg excitons differ from their ground state counterparts. And so to remind you, perhaps, is um, ground state excitons consist of an electron and a hole. And so the way they, they interact is by a collisional interaction. So they, they collide. And because they consist of their composite uh, bosons consisting of fermions, there's Pauli repulsion. And you see that there's a repulsive interaction that's effective on the range of their size. So here, that's a nanometer range. But then if you go to the Rydberg uh, states and their polarization forces, Courses, we all know, and these can be effective over much, much longer distances. We get like an enhancement of like three orders of magnitude or so uh, in the size of and, and scale of these interactions. Uh, and we've calculated this. Uh, now, here you see it like kind of coming like the, the potential uh, energy surfaces for two Rydberg states uh, at large distances, kind of flat. And then, as we, as we all know, there's, there's these Van der Waals uh, interaction potentials coming out and merging. Uh, into the, the spaghetti region. And where, when you uh, project onto the total angular momentum, uh, or like when you when you separate by the total angular momentum projection uh, along the uh, the intermolecular axis, then you can extract Van der Waals coefficients here um, for all of these ends from these exact diagonalizations. Uh, and so this is what I've got here. I, I divide the C6 uh, coefficient by n to the 11, and just actually see that these uh, that these coefficients are like the Van der Waals coefficients are roughly constant, as you might, as we all expect from uh, from Rydberg physics from second order perturbation theory. We have this strong scaling that we know from atomic physics that carries over uh, to excitonic physics. But as I already advertised, what's surprising actually is that the the absolute strength of the C six coefficient, if you take one principal quantum number, say n equals fifteen, is much stronger in the excitonic case. And here we see like an enhancement of almost half a million. So the interaction strength of the equals 15 corresponds to that what we would see in atomic like in atomic systems at n equals 50. And this is due to these different scales of the uh, of the energy and the Bohr radius of the uh, the Rydberg energy and the, the Bohr radius. So um, over the last couple of years, like I've, I've been very interested in like translating these interactions into optical responses. And what we've seen on the uh, uh, on the uh, classical in the, uh, level is that we can, using these the the interactions that we've calculated in combination with Rydberg-Plaquet physics, we can 
uh, very well explain the nonlinear absorption experiments uh, that have been carried out. And this is kind of special in the in the field of semiconductors, where uh, to to get like quantitative agreement because where where normally one is satisfied with a with a with um, <clears throat> quant uh, quant uh, qualitative agreement. Yes, and so even better agree or like more specific signatures of these interactions can be seen in some probe experiments here uh, where we really can see the uh, specific signatures of long range uh, interactions and so what i want uh, to do in the in the next uh, couple of minutes or like for, for this talk is to tell you like how we can push these um the the nonlinear optical response into the quantum limit. Uh, and uh, present a couple of ideas um, that we've developed for this. And I've done this uh, work in collaboration with a couple of colleagues. Um, so here, uh, especially Anna Sarsen from Denmark, Hamid Kohadi, that we've already heard about, Thomas Foltz, that we've done experiments, uh, Thomas Poe and Aarhus and Susanne Yeli at Harvard. Okay, so we've, uh, so like, uh, as Matt was already saying, uh, saying the, the statistics, the quantum statistics of light are very well evidenced by second order correlation functions. And this is one of the experiments uh, that goes back to 2019 uh, uh, that shows the status of like how well can, can we produce quantum light using excitons. And, and here we see that there's just this tiny deviation in this plot we've already seen. Uh, there's really not that much. There's a, a slight deviation from the classical limit uh, at zero. And this is kind of the, the state of the art with excitons. Um, while in atomic physics, we already see like complex, uh, complex states of light being produced in, in the nuclear cell. Okay, so uh, given this background, let's now like go into three different strategies how we can still exploit the, the conditions of copper oxide um, to see uh, some uh, quantum, uh, quantum correlations in the light. So this is this work with Anas. Um, and to remind you this, this, uh, this is the copper oxide spectrum that we've uh, just seen as this phenomenally back, uh, uh, or bad and big uh, phonon background and some Rydberg states. So this is a measurement from the 60s. So we don't see all the Rydberg states that we see now in beautiful experiments, um, uh, but that's essentially it. And, and, and so like what we can, the takeaway here is that Copper oxide as a material is pretty weakly coupling, not compared to atomic st uh, systems, but like compared to other semiconductors, uh, and it has a significant phonon background. And immediately, one might think, like, is this the, is this a good system to look for photon correlations at all? Uh, and what I want to convince you of, about that is that it maybe is actually. And so yesterday or two days ago, in Matt's talk, we saw like the spherical cow. This is not a spherical cow. This is a rectangular. Uh, semiconductor and our model for uh, for how we uh, uh, how we describe photon propagations through the semiconductor. So let's say this is a semiconductor we send through a, a Gaussian beam. When the Gaussian wherever the Gaussian beam is, it can uh, create excitons. Say let's say this is one exciton that we can create. It has the uh, the blockade radius around it. So now when the exciton uh, decays, it can decay either. Uh, in the mode that it came from, or it can decay into some other other mode. Uh, and so there's, of course, a, a ratio between these two uh, rates. Uh, and in fact, this ratio, this loss ratio of beta is unknown in copper oxide, uh, but it's probably relatively low. So um, <clears throat> how do we now describe uh, the dynamics of, say, two photons uh, through the through the crystal. So let me walk you through this. This is a, a photon propagation for these two excitations where we can either have two photons. This is described by the by the wave function component EE. We can have a photon and an exciton. This would be EP uh, plus in the symmetric superposition or EP minus in the anti-symmetric superposition. So this capital R is the center of mass of these two excitations. And the, uh, the lowercase r is the relative distance between the two. Uh, excitations, and then we see that now the, the center of mass takes the takes the position of time here in, in this Schrodinger equation, and there's um, a transverse part uh, described by transverse dynamics uh, described by this this part. Then there's some coupling uh, and uh, interaction 
component here. So there may be a few things that already um, stand out here. So one is that, that there is no component of having two excitons, um, which is something that we can exactly eliminate from the limit of uh, CW drive uh, uh, and uh, substitute back into these equations. And the other thing is that, okay, so we see the sequence factor uh, uh, beta here, but because I scale here, I scale the, the equations with the linear component. So I, I took out the linear part of the absorption, um, basically, but the, the G2 function that we want to calculate at the end is only a function of this EE. -E. And so this already shows that the, the parallel absorption into other states, such as the phonons, um, does not matter. Uh, so the, the linear loss is irrelevant for correlations, for photon correlations in transmission. Okay, so this, this potential here uh, looks like this. It has a, a flat top or soft shoulder um, uh, form. Uh, at short separations, there's relative gain. So the, the, the photons are relatively protected uh, against absorption. And then there's also a nonlinear refractive part to this potential. Okay, so enough with these uh, equations. Let's see like how a photon pair would propagate through the crystal. So what we see here is a plot where into the plane, we see the crystal length. So we propagate further and further through the crystal and look at the correlations of the wave function at the output. Uh, and we do this in parallel for conditions of low loss, so low beta and high loss, high beta. So initially, when we, when we just enter the crystal, this is a coherent light field, that's an uncorrelated two photon field, uh, so it has no correlations. So then as we go through the crystal, there are correlations building up. So we see a dip here from uh, that deepens and deepens and deepens until it hits like a very low low value. And then something happens when the, when the crystal becomes uh, even longer than that. So to compare this uh, in uh, some more detail, so we have like kind of for conditions of, of, of low loss, we see that there are very wide correlations. So the, the photonic correlation is red as we, as we in, in the relative distance between the two particles as we go through the crystal. Then there's like one crystal length at which the, um, the, the emerging or the, the transmitted photon field is very much anti bunched it's perfectly anti bunched And then if we go beyond that, that is we say we make the, the crystal even longer, then we see that photons like to come out at the same time. So there's there's photon bunch. On the other hand, like if they're under conditions of, of high loss, we see that they're very narrow uh, correlations in the relative coordinate. There's still strong anti bunching but it's not quite finite. Like there's, uh, it's not quite uh, zero. It doesn't hit this uh, point of perfect anti bunching And then for very long crystals, we see that there's uh, <laughs> photon uh, bunching, but at finite times. So the photons like to come out at a certain time difference. So how can we understand this? So let's go back to this, this equation. Actually, it can be nicely summarized uh, in this form where uh, we say that there's like kind of the blue parts are the non-interacting uh, parts of the Hamiltonian. So they define some, some sort of a polarity on Hamiltonian. And then there's B, uh, the interaction. And so as always with these equations, if we want to uh, propagate them uh, in one dimension, we can do that uh, in a perturbative expansion. So the field that comes out of the semiconductor uh, is the sum of the transfer matrices uh, <coughs> acting on this, uh, uh, on, this, on this input state. And these transfer matrices are, is, is an expansion in B. So we have the, the field that hasn't scattered at all. We have the wave function components that have scattered once. We have those that scatter twice, three times, and so on. And in fact, we see that the uh, um, that by comparing with uh, exact numerics, we see that the, the first order approximation, so just retaining the zeroth order and the first order terms, gives an excellent approximation to the exact dynamics. Could you remind me of the time? Uh, yes, sir, you have plenty. Like, okay. Um, so how do we understand? So under conditions of, uh, of low loss, uh, so initially we have an input field that is um, that is flat. So there's, there, there are no correlations. And then as the, as the photons propagate through the semiconductor, maybe they're scattered once. And so this, 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 this scattered wave function here uh, uh, comes about because the, the photon gets absorbed, and then you have to do the math. So actually, uh, it's really out of phase and interferes destructively 
with the, with the weight function component that hasn't scattered at all. And so this is why we see like slight dip, like even uh, after short uh, propagation distance. Then as you make the crystal longer and longer, uh, more of these processes can happen and they all add up and they all eat away from the, from the unscattered weight function. So that's why like this, uh, this uh, photonic correlation function starts getting a dip that gets deeper and deeper. Uh, but eventually, like as you make the crystal very long, uh, these photon photons um, dominate, so the scattered uh, wave functions actually dominate. And uh, if you use squared, so we see that this becomes uh, bunching at, at, at zero. Okay, so under conditions of, of high loss, um, it's it's easier to think about a polarity picture. So. Uh, I want you to imagine this uh, as, uh, as an excitonic resonance. Uh, and we're sending in uh, the, uh, the, the, the severe light beam that's exactly resonant uh, with the excitonic transition. So we're just here, we have two photons that sit exactly on this dashed line, uh, and that's the free propagation, and the photons get absorbed, of course, as they propagate. But now, if there's a scattering event, these two photons will scatter into some momentum states that lie around the state zero, and the spread in momentum space is exactly given, uh, or it's roughly given by one over the blockade radius that we, that we see. So we now, like after the scattering event, uh, we have a polariton wave uh, with components still at K zero, but also components uh, to both higher and lower momentum. Uh, and so now, as you go further through the crystal, you'll see that the components that, have, that are shifted away from the resonance experience less absorption because they're detuned uh, from the excitonic uh, resonance, uh, resonance. And that, that applies both on the red and on the, on the loose. So in fact, we see that these, these side peaks here in momentum space uh, are relatively enhanced. Uh, and we see that, that, that pairs of a red and a blue detuned photon after the scattering uh, process have a higher probability of making it through the crystal and therefore uh, dominate the transmission. So we see that they're entangled red blue uh, photon pairs. Okay, so now the question of course is like how realistic is this? Do we see quantum light in general under what conditions do we, do we see it? So let's look at the condition that's a sufficient condition if G2 of zero is smaller than one. Uh, we see quantum light, and, and here uh, I calculate this for the transmitted field uh, and map it out for various loss factors. So remember, large beta means large loss, uh, and as a function of the crystal, the units of the coherence lens uh, of um, the the process. So yeah, so and and here, so for for realistic, uh, so what what we expect. Uh, like somewhat realistic values of beta, so maybe coupling uh, a coupling constant in the in the percent range somewhere here, you would still see very much um, non-classes alive if you choose the crystal to have the right length. Uh, and so this would be a crystal that corresponds to a couple of hundreds or uh, uh, microns. Uh, and so this is very stable. Uh, even if, if the blockade radius isn't very large. So you can also go to a uh, fairly low principle one. Okay, so now the second strategy. So this, 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 this was one way of, uh, of, uh, of producing uh, correlated photons in the presence of lots of loss. And the, the, the more traditional way, which I will just uh, quickly uh, or briefly, briefly the set is one where you couple the the, the Rydberg states strongly to 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 light. Um, in fact, that's like kind of the the traditional way, the way that um, the very small uh, correlations in Gaussian arsenide were detected is by making very good cavities and then integrating for a very long time and translating the the small correlations that the that the small interactions of of, of, of excitons. Uh, induce the photon field uh, end of measuring those. Uh, and here, of course, the problem is that copper oxide doesn't only doesn't couple very strongly uh, strongly to light. And it, in my opinion, it's it's therefore all, all the more impressive that the uh, that the group of Amit Mahali managed, as we uh, we just saw this picture already, uh, to to reach the limit of strong coupling. So here, just to remind you, we see the light modes in the cavity that so there are multi multiple light modes in the structure of cavity and the 
and the horizontal lines are the uh, the excitonic uh, rip rock states and wherever they cross uh, you see that there's a, there, there's an anti crossing um, and so we could describe this actually quite well but if you do that, like even in the presence of all of this phonon coupling and so on uh, and you see that there are nice polariton peaks emerging for n equals three four five six actually for n equals two there's something special happening um, so we don't see the strong coupling limit here and at higher end we also don't see it there the uh, the uh, decay is too large. Uh, but here for a couple of values, we see like kind of very nice polaritons uh, emerging. And, uh, and so uh, this, I think, is like a, a, a nice prospect for the field um, that we can couple strongly to light. And what, what, what hasn't been done yet, and, what is, and that's something that we're working on, uh, is to demonstrate that now we can combine this or we can actually see the Rydberg interactions that we know are there. Uh, in these systems with polaritons to translate them into atomic conditions. Okay, so this was just a very, very short, uh, short traditional way of, uh, of creating quantum light with uh, semiconductor technical. And finally, like kind of, I want to switch gears uh, a bit uh, and talk about two of these semiconductors uh, in the last how many minutes do I have? Uh, you still have five minutes and just 10 minutes. Okay, got a pass. Okay, great. So, uh, so I know that we like kind of yesterday uh, in the, uh, and on Monday we had uh, the transition from you know alkali to alkali earth atoms and like all the differences there in semiconductor physics the the transitions can be much more radical. So now we're going from a bulk material to a two dimensional material uh, that looks like this. So it's like a um, it's, it's called the TMB, a transition metal like the progenite, um, uh, that looks like this. It's almost, it's almost atomically thin, has a hexagonal structure, and really like rose to fame in the in the wake of graphene um, because it's very much like graphene, except that it has has a band gap, uh, and so this band gap allows it to actually show like excitonic uh, resonance, uh, and. Okay, so there's a lot uh, that can be can, can be said about these materials and, and the exciting physics that we can see like on the electronic uh, level and so on. But like for, for the purposes of this talk, what I, I really want you to know is that there, there are excitons in these materials. And the excitons, if, if you illuminate one of those excitonic resonances uh, resonantly, then uh, one of those layers acts as a microscopic mirror. So send them the photon, it will get reflected. Uh, and this has been seen uh, experimentally a couple of years years ago. So here you see like one of these CNG flakes uh, in reflection, and you see that there's eighty five percent reflection. But if uh, if if you now remove the excitonic resonance, if it's done here by voltage, so you just move the uh, resonance, then then the reflection goes away. Uh, and in addition to this, there are, there are ripper states. Uh, in TMB, so here we see them up to n equals five. Here you see them up to n equals eleven, uh, and there is a fair debate, like on how strong uh, these Rydberg states really are, uh, because we use strong magnetic fields to measure them here. Uh, but for now, I will just assume that there are very strong interactions. You can see the blockade, uh, and we'll discuss with you like what what we will see under these conditions. Okay, so. Uh, now looking at, at this mirror, or oh, like at this at the semiconductor, now it's two dimensional. Uh, let's just send a few photons onto this mirror, and and of course I told you it's a mirror. So if we if we just have these photons coming in, they will bounce back. Uh, and now I want to combine this uh, with EIT that we've already heard about again. Uh, so coupling coupling this uh, ground state exciton. So here this is a transition from the vacuum, no exciton at all to the ground state excitons to a river state. Uh, and thereby establishing conditions of EIT. Uh, and it said electromagnetically induced transparency. So right, like photons will just transmit through the air. Individual photons will. Uh, and this this is true, but it's it's not quite true actually because uh, they will not. I mean, they will transmit, but they will not transmit completely as if the as if the as if the mirror wasn't there. So in fact, there's a time delay. Like every photon that goes through this mirror. Uh, will be delayed compared to a photon that, that uh, travels through free space. The time delay is given on that means 
by the ratio of gamma and omega squared, so the Rabi uh, coupling on the upper transition. Um, and so now if we go to the limit where we have multiple photons and assume that there's Rydberg rotate, then, um, uh, then let's see, like kind of we will have like multiple photons coming in and one photon can make it through, but the while it's in the semiconductor, Produces Rydberg brocade and, and leaves um, uh, uh, the basically moves this Rydberg state out of resonance and leaves the mirror state um, for the for the remaining photons. Okay, so we can analyze this in transmission. Like, what does uh, what are the photonic correlation functions? Of course, if you make the photons very far apart uh, in time, then there's no then there are no correlations that you can see. But as you go like towards smaller correlations, there's very nice, uh, there are very nice anti-correlations uh, to be seen. And the rise time going from this uh, from from this perfectly anti-bunch light to no correlations at all is just given by the by the delay that I told you about by this linear delay, the time that it takes the one photon uh, to make it through the mirror. Okay, now there are a couple of games that you can play. For example, you can you can increase the, the drive strength and thereby induce Rabi oscillations of these excitons, uh, making the uh, the period just slightly slightly smaller. Uh, and that's all something that we can calculate uh, exactly. But uh, I want to draw your attention to this uh, to to the empty correlations or the quantumness of this light that makes it through uh, at, at at low times, or like at zero time delay. Okay, and uh, and as always uh, in this semiconductor world, something that's very important uh, uh, to look at is the uh, is is the is the dominant loss mechanism and how important it is um, for the uh, uh, for the function of uh, of uh, of a device. And here, this is the Rydberg loss. Uh, and in fact, we see that that the, that the quantumness of the light is actually very robust again. Uh, Against loss, and so here this is the units of the of the already very fast uh, loss rate of the of the ground state exciton. Here, so like it, it, yeah, you see that um, that the photonic correlation functions really stay well below uh, one. Okay, so this uh, actually already brings me to the end of my talk. Um, uh, I would like to conclude really trying to convince you that there's uh, that that it's quite amazing that these um, semiconductor uh, excitons uh, of very very high quantum numbers have been observed so we've seen uh, them up to n equals uh, 30 and I, I still think this is remarkable so I can, we can talk about it over coffee or so like that 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 electrons holes bind, bind in these uh, semiconductors to billions of crystal cells and are, are not disturbed. So then we saw, or we could show that uh, that the Rydberg excitons provide very strong interactions, uh, and that, that the interactions then translate into strong um, classical nonlinearities of the Gernot fields uh, that we can describe quantitatively. And then finally, I showed you three different ways of um, how we can propose to see now quantum uh, statistics from its life. And some of this work is ongoing, especially. Um, with the uh, Rydberg exciton polarities. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you very much for the wonderful talks. This is open for discussion. I see immediately uh, the questions. Uh, thank you. You emphasized that the um, statistical vision of Rydberg interaction is much stronger in the material. So you have a lower end and you have a Interaction span of corresponding to an atom is much higher, but the, the simplest parameter that really is, goes into a bigger merit for evaluating whether these things are useful for saying time generation is always the product of the interaction times the uh, lifetime of these uh, river states. Mm -hmm. So, what is the lifetime? Right, the lifetime. The lifetime is of course much shorter again. So that's I mean that's that, that's this balance. So at the in the beginning, I showed you this graph where the where the interaction strengths are on the on the right hand side, so much enhanced compared to atoms, but the lifetimes are much shorter. And, and so um, but it's the product, and how does the product go? Is it comparable or worse? Um I think in the at the end of the day, currently it's worse. 
but there's also, I mean, it's it's diff difficult to say because it depends on the principle of quantum number. There's no direct scale, or like the scaling that we know from atomic physics doesn't immediately carry over to excitons. It does to some extent. Um, so that's like some plot that um, I haven't shown. Uh, actually, it was one over n to the three scale for the for the line width or the, the lifetime. Um, actually, it's also seen uh, in excitons, but only from uh, say three to fifteen. And after that, something else happens, and lifetimes somehow saturate and don't go down further. And so it's like still not quite clear why this is. So there could be charge defects in the crystal. It could be other defects. It could be plasma coupling. Um, and so I think it, it kind of depends on like whether or not we can for high end say like we can we can follow this trend. Yeah. So, so just to make this, so that's the reason why you don't resolve beyond beyond thirty is simply because the lifetime keep stops decreasing with n and suddenly you have a, some sort of some sort of yeah, yeah, yeah it, there, there are various reasons for this. Like if uh, its temperature is off up to n equals 30 or so, and that's like for a long time um, the experimentalists in Dortmund believed that this was that, that that their that their experiment was just not cold enough to see higher states, and then they did use a cold, colder environment and did actually not observe more states. So the current explanation that there are two leading explanations. This one is that there's a residual like slight low density plasma in the material from some charge defects or so um, that that would lead to a destruction of the um, of the Rickford states, which you can basically, I mean, in a classical model, you can somehow think that the that the Coulomb tails, the long range Coulomb tails are cut off and you get exponential, which just uh, cuts the infinite series of Rickford states and makes them finite. That's one of the explanations. The other one is that there are static charge defects in the crystal, uh, which induce start the star trips everywhere and also would ionize um, higher line with this. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a question for the second. Uh, and, uh, could you go back to the slide where you saw your Rydberg exciton polariton in your Rydberg series there? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the next one. No, the one with the other. The, yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. So, when, when you do spectroscopy in the atomic, world you, you typically like the subsequent Rydberg states of the same line profile mm. and here this is completely different yeah so, so is there something that we can take from the atomic physics that uh, from a fundamental difference here so I, I think like one of the reasons here is that the that the, that the coupling strength right is uh, it changes very much so uh, for these low line states so like sometimes you have like a, a large spectrum here and then the splitting is just very small compared to the line width. Yes. Uh, so if that was like much stronger, which we would get from higher cavity, I think that these curves would look much more universal. In oh, that's, that's an artifact of the cavity. Or, or... Well, I mean, like just like that we are at low end, I think we had n equals three to, to six. Mm -hmm. So there are like still very, very, very large differences. Also, like you see like other peaks coming in here. So this is like a, the neighboring state uh, and making it into the picture. Yeah. Uh, so I think all of this contributes to making this look non-universal. Mm -hmm. If you had a cavity that was much, was much stronger or like much better and resolved these states, uh, or like split the split the lines much wider, we would see much cleaner cleaner effects. Another thing is that that this is uh, done in single photon transition or like in, in a in a direct dipole transition. So you have like all of these this phonon backgrounds mm -hmm. uh, that makes it. That, that contributes here that we have to actually like, uh, compute like how how couples how, how you get varietals in the presence of a uh, uh, phonon coupling. If you use like some some two-fold on transition, for example, for which the dipole moment would then be much lower, uh, <clears throat> this would be much cleaner. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, further questions? This does not appear the case. So let's thank both our speakers. We have a short debate, but Stephen would 